Welcome, everyone, and thank you again for your, if you're rejoining us for the second part of our series. Thank you for being here again. If you've missed the first part of the series, it's archived on the Hugh Freedy website and the Friends of Hugh Freedy areas. Um, I'm glad to be able to present to you this evening a little bit on dental implant maintenance. Um, we spoke a little bit about assessment last time, so we're going to talk about the maintenance phases this time. I want to thank Hugh Freedy for the incredible amount of work that they've put into this um, two webinar series, uh, specifically this maintenance section in getting it together with me, and I really do appreciate that. We have a lot to cover this evening. Um, we're going to talk really a lot about the maintenance functions, uh, specifically focusing on the role of the dental hygienist um, and the different types of evidence and research that is out there and available to make the decision making on your maintenance with your implant patients um, seamless. These webinars and a lot of the programs that we give at the ADIA were born of a lot of confusion. People are unsure and unclear of what they should or shouldn't be doing with their implant patients. And we're so happy that we've been able to provide the information to give everyone a, you know, immediate takeaway that they can bring back to the office the next morning um, to put into practice. So we hope that you'll find that from this evening's webinar as well. We will be having a question and answer session at the end, um, so you can certainly um, save your questions. Just jot them down as we're going through if you have any questions that you'd like to have cleared up at the end of the webinar. The long-term success of implants is relying on so many different things. Um, we are focusing, of course, tonight on the maintenance and the compliance of the patient, um, but there are so many different aspects and, and different facets of implant dentistry that go into long-term success. Um, we're just looking at the post-restoration care. We're looking at post-surgical, post-restoration care and the maintenance that our patients um, will require from us. Just as a little recap, if you were with us last time, uh, we talked very clearly about why a tooth and an implant are so dramatically different. Um, that difference stems from the fact that a tooth is ankylosed into the bone, uh, whereas um, the implant does not have any intervening PDL. A tooth, on the other hand, is suspended in a socket by a periodontal ligament. Um, so it's got proprioception and it's got some mobility. The implant is, you know, ankylosed, so there's no, no intervening mobility that it can have. However, the restorative parts and pieces that are built on top of it can be subject to different types of mobility. Because all of the periodontal fibers are lost when the tooth is lost, um, the cellular epithelium is quite different around an implant. We know that there is only one fiber that is left in the tissue of the sulcus around an implant, and that is a circular fiber, which is very weak um, and not very resistant to bacterial invasion in the mouth. So we know that the, these aspects are going to make our care and our maintenance a little bit different than it is around a tooth. We always want to start before doing any type of maintenance protocols, we want to start with a thorough assessment of our patient. Now we did thoroughly look at the assessment parameters in the last webinar. Um, this is the Hugh Freedy checklist that the ADIA has worked hard to develop. And this checklist just walks you through all of the different facets that you should be looking at when assessing dental implants. And it also provides an incredible tool for documentation so that you have thorough documentation of what you're looking at. And it's also able to be, you know, shared with other clinicians that may share that same patient. One of the things that I really want to focus on this evening in your maintenance decision is the science. We're going to be looking at a lot of scientific evidence because the first place that your decision should start with is the research. What is safe? What is effective? What isn't going to harm this patient? Then you're going to look at the clinical criteria of the patient and what the patient actually presents with. You're going to pepper in your experience, your judgment, your training, and look at the patient's preferences, especially when it comes to oral hygiene devices that they may be using at home. And that's how you're going to develop your, your module for making your decisions on how you're going to approach that patient for care. One of the main things that has changed over the years in implant dentistry is implant surfaces. And that's why we've seen such a dramatic shift in our thought processes. That's why we've seen such a shift in the research that has been done. Um, when implants first came onto the scene and were being researched heavily in the 70s and 80s, 
we used incredibly smooth titanium implants. We wanted them as pure as possible because that's what we thought that we needed to have the body accept them. Well, we learned through research and trial and error that the body accepts titanium as its own and that the smoother the implant surface, the less we will get bone to attach to it. So there was a huge explosion of changes in implant surfaces. And as you can see on the screen, the more roughened an implant surface now, the more beneficial it is because with the more interaction we can get with bone cells and the better osseointegration we can achieve. So implant surfaces have changed. And because the implant surfaces have changed, that has really changed what we do in terms of um, selecting maintenance armamentarium for our use. Again, when we looked at commercially pure titanium of the past, which you could see in, in the image at the top, commercially pure titanium was great, but it had some drawbacks. One of them you'll see very readily on the slide in front of you. It had little titanium tags. They were little excess pieces of titanium. Um, and what we've learned in implant dentistry is in the laboratory and in production and manufacturing, when we mix alloys with titanium, we can still keep the same acceptability of the titanium to the body, but it makes it very strong because commercially pure titanium is not incredibly strong and under certain shear forces can actually crack. Um, we saw implants break into two pieces in certain, jaw under, in certain jaws under certain conditions. So when we added that titanium alloy, the alloy component, we strengthened the titanium. And what we were able to do then again in the laboratory is smooth it out thus reducing the tags that we had in the commercially pure titanium. Now, one of the things I want to draw to your attention in this slide is you'll see at the bottom slide B, that titanium alloy, it looks like there are lines. And there are. Those are called machining lines. Those aren't scratches. Those are pure machining lines. And that's what you see under a microscope. And this is pretty heavily magnified. Um, you see those machining lines. But as you can see, it's just a smooth plate of titanium alloy there. One of the things you really want to focus on is where are you working? And I really want you to take note of this because it's an important concept that we're going to study on a lot this evening. When we look at an implant, where the hygienist instruments and where the maintenance happens is actually up here. It's in the area of um, the soft tissue, this area where the bone is, and the side of the implant, which is roughened, is where bone should be attached to. Your instruments and your maintenance here happen here, supracrestally. And that's why this is important. This area is a nice, smooth titanium that we don't want to scratch. This area here is a very roughened titanium that we want bone to grow to. And you'll see as we go through the presentation this evening, why some of those factors are so important. When you're selecting your armamentarium, there are a lot of things that you really should consider. The first thing you're going to look at is what is the prosthetic device that is sitting on top of this implant? Is it removable? Is it cemented on? Is it screwed on? Um, that's going to give you some indication as to what you need to access with your instruments. The second thing is what are you trying to remove? Biofilms can be removed with things other than instrumentation. Is there any biofilm? Is this calculus that you're dealing with? And how strong is that calculus? What's the tenacity of it? Is this excess cement? And we're going to look at all of these things this evening. You're going to look at the adaption of your scalers. How much room do you have? What positions are you able to get those scalers into? Do you have a scalar system that has a lot of different angulations and different designs so that you can work in at virtually any area? If you do in, uh, encounter calculus, one of the most important things that I want you to remember is you're going to dry it off, and you're going to use gentle exploratory strokes um, in overlapping circular motions in a coronal direction. And of course, the other thing we're really going to focus on this evening is your instrument material and what that instrument is made of. Does it matter? What choices are out there and what maintenance instruments do you have? Well, I'd like to do a poll here. 
And I'd like to look um, at the different types of, of instrumentation that are available. If everyone could go ahead and on the screen, just go ahead and check what type of instrument you're using in your offices. Because I'd love to see um, what the statistics are showing from the people that I'm speaking to this evening. Give it a minute so you can all go ahead and enter your answers there. When we see the numbers, you know, um, stop moving around, we'll know that, that everybody's gone ahead and answered. You know, selection of instrumentation, really, it does matter. And we're going to thoroughly look at that um, this evening, and we're going to look at the research on that so that we can give you um, a good, firm background of the scientific research um, that we want to look at there. OK, I think um, almost everybody's gone ahead and answered. I still see uh, you know, some compilation going on there. Great. We're going to go ahead and um, show the results here. And as you, I can see from here, um, most people are using hand scalers. That's, that's a great thing. We're going to actually walk through all of the different types of um, instruments that were on this slide this evening, so we could look at the research related to those. So we're just going to move this poll off to the side, and then we're going to continue. So it does matter. It matters a lot. And the first place that we want to look at is the science. And we want to look at unbiased, pure research. You know, all articles are not created equal. We want to look at research that is published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, we want to look at good scientific research. And while textbooks um, are a very good resource, they do get outdated. And we want to make sure that it's not opinion that we're looking at. We want tried and true, unbiased research to go ahead and base um, our scientifically driven care on. Um, the most current piece of research that has reviewed years and years worth of implant maintenance um, was published in 2012 in June by Laropolu. And we're going to look a lot at that piece of research this evening because it has really summed up um, decades of work in implant maintenance. Um, most of the research that you see here is quoted on all the slides. You'll see pieces of research quoted on all of the bottom um, parts of the slides. And if anybody has um, any questions on those things, you're certainly more than welcome to, to shoot me an email um, or email um, Hugh Freedy, and they'll get that email to us. But we've got a lot of research to look through. Implant maintenance has, has been heavily researched. And we know clearly what the research does show. It doesn't hide anything. I want to look at um, one of the early studies from 1990. Um, and it really looked at some basic different types of, of instruments that you could use um, for maintenance. You could see there the rubber cup. And again, you can see those machining lines. But you can see that there are no gouges, no deep grooves. Whereas when you move to the metal scaler, you can clearly see the scratching and the gouges that were created. A cavajet, um, an air polisher with sodium bicarbonate, was looked at. And you can see the gouging that, that has occurred there. And of course, then you see in the lower right-hand corner an ultrasonic tip. That was a metal tip. And you can see the deep grooves that were created there. Um, so this was very early work by Rapley. Um, and it, it set the boundaries. It started to, to say, hey, we've really got to be careful with what we're doing with our implant maintenance. So if we look further to some more recent research, in 1996, Montessoro studied again. Um, and you'll see that the SCMs are a little different here. They're, they're in green. Um, but you could also see visibly on the left-hand side um, the effects of these different instruments. You can obviously see um, the scratching of the stainless steel. And you can also see you know, the, the pieces of titanium that were actually scratched into in that SCM on the right. You can also see very clearly that the titanium curette on the left, those scratches are visible to the naked eye. And again, um, you can see that it has left those pieces of titanium chips behind. You see here that um, the resin-filled curette um, has left in the SEM, you can see a little bit of something. On the left-hand side, you don't see any scratches. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what you're actually seeing here, it's actually bits and pieces of that scalar that were left behind. So you know, it didn't gouge, uh, it didn't scratch, but it certainly left pieces behind. You can see what the stainless steel ultrasonic has done um, in the middle image. And then the plastic tip ultrasonic at the very, at the very bottom um, showed to be no, no harm involved in that one. 
So let's look a little bit further. So there are power scalers that are available with implant-specific tips. Um, and you'll see a variety of them here on the screen. Um, it's real important that if you're going to use these, you check the manufacturer's recommended um, usage for them. And uh, usually those little tips get changed between every patient. Um, so it's very important to look at the sterilization recommendations of the manufacturer for these instruments as well. One of the really important things that has come to light in the research with these blue tips is if they come in contact at all with a roughened implant surface, you can see what happens. Pieces of the um, tip will be embedded to the side of the implant and can cause some serious, serious problems for that implant. So if these instruments are used, they absolutely must be used supracrestally. Okay, so that you never get that, that instrument to touch the side of that implant or any area that can be roughened because as you can see, that can cause some, some serious issues for those implants. Okay, let's take another poll for a minute. What is your implant scaler made of? Do you know? And you don't, you might not know, and that's okay because I'm going to take you through the research this evening and teach you what all the different things are made of. Um, so hopefully that you can make some, some good, um, decisions. See a couple of people chiming in here. We'll give it a couple of minutes to tabulate. The choice that you make in your scalar matters a lot. And you're going to see, as you've already seen from the research, that not only is efficacy important in getting the job done, but safety is incredibly important. Because we certainly do not want to scratch or mar any parts or pieces of the implant, of the abutment, or of the prosthetic restoration. Those scratches or gouges would certainly produce um, an area or anitis for calculus and plaque to be built up. Okay, we're seeing a, a good demonstration of different types of instruments that are being used out there. A couple people unsure, thank you for that honest response. Um, we'll move that poll over to the side and let's take a look at, at some more research. Um, and we'll take a look at um, actually what some of the instrumentation has shown, the, the types of materials has shown. Well, this is the Fox research um, from 1990. Again, you see that control in the upper left-hand corner. Um, you see a plastic curette in the upper right-hand corner. Um, you see a stainless steel curette in the lower left-hand corner, and then a tita titanium alloy curette also. The stainless steel curette in this research has done a couple of things. Not only is it scratched, but it's actually physically altered the surface of the implant. Now, our first obligation to our implant patients is not only to use safe and effective materials and, and armamentarium, but it's not to alter the surface or the structures of anything that we're working on. Because obviously, um, that can cause some long-term problems. So stainless steel has the problem that it scratches, it alters surfaces, but there's another huge problem with it. Stainless steel and titanium are two very dissimilar metals. And you can see a lot of galvanism happen between the two metals, which would cause a lot of corrosion um, and cause a lot of different problems from um, an implant success um, perspective. So stainless steel scalers are not safe, and they are not effective for implant maintenance. So let's continue to look down the line of instruments that are available and what the result is from the research. Again, looking at the, at the Fox research, let's take a look at our titanium scalers. Again, if you look back to the research, they scratch. Laropolu discovered that in her research of reviewing all of the literature. This piece by Fox also quotes it. There are other pieces um, of research that have shown scratch, scratching by the titanium scalers. Um, they were originally created for repair. And we are going to spend the last um, couple of minutes of this um, webinar this evening talking about what repair is. Um, so that's going to be um, an important section for you to understand that um, you're not going to use these scalers for maintenance because they will scratch and mar, and obviously that is what we are 
number one trying to avoid doing. Now, we've looked at the stainless steel. We've looked at the titanium. Let's go ahead and look at the plastic. There are graphite scalers, okay? One of the problems um, with graphite scalers is they can leave bits and pieces of themselves behind. Um, and if you look um, at the research here, um, you can see pieces of, of the, the graphite that were left behind. And that's a problem. Um, that's a problem from a tissue response um, focus and from an irritant focus. So the, the research by Brookshire really clearly shows that with those graphite scalers. Now, let's look at, at different types of plastic. We have filled and unfilled resins. And it's real important to take a look at this. An unfilled resin versus a filled resin is very different in terms of strength. We add fillers to make a resin stronger. And if you, you look at any of your filling materials, if you look at any of your sealant materials, the filled resins withstand occlusal force, occlusal load, clenching, grinding, bruxing, a lot more than unfilled resins. The problem when we look at an implant maintenance instrument is those filling materials are often the detrimental portions of them. Those bits of glass and reinforcing filling materials and fibers that are used to reinforce these, these materials, these resins, can scratch and can also, like the graphite, be left behind. So pieces of material, again, would be left behind. And when you think about that from a tissue perspective, um, that's one of the things that can certainly cause a major problem. So not all resins are created alike. And it's really important to know that. And it's really important to know um, what your instrument is made of. Let's take a look here um, at some research. Um, this research here was by Hallman. Um, and it's real important to look at the, the study, but also look at the replication of this study. Not only did Matasaro um, was able to replicate the results, Spielman, Mengel, Meffert, Mecki, Moser, Thompson, Neal, Rapley, and Bolin were all able to replicate in research the effects of instrumentation um, with an unfilled resin scalar. So you can see here at the top our titanium abutment control, and then you can see the filled resin scalar, and you can very clearly see those scratches. And then look at the bottom again and see that there were no scratches formed with an unfilled resin scalar. So um, very good research here um, that has been replicated numerous times. So what's in your implant scaler? Now I've given you a little bit of a background. Um, you can see um, some of the scaler systems that are there. And I'm sure that you're all thinking, gee, I wonder what I do have in the office. But if you're using those filled resin scalers, um, you're on, honestly not being the best clinician you possibly can be in looking at the research and doing what is most safe and effective. So we definitely want to look for something that works. And you want to use an unfilled resin scaler, because we know by all of the research that these are safe, these are effective, and they are user friendly. Um, so let's take a little bit of a look at the unfilled resin scalers. Um, let's look at the different types of designs that are out there um, and, and what benefits they'll have to us. Here's an unfilled resin tip variety. Um, these are the Hugh Freedies. These are the Implicare 2s. Um, and they are 20% thinner than the Implicare 1 line. Um, but what you're seeing is you're seeing a very vast variety of tip designs. And the benefit of the multiple tip designs is no matter what area you're working in, you would have an instrument that you would be able to get to wherever that abutment is, regardless of what the restoration is. Uh, you can see there's the Langer 1-2s. Those are meant for you know telescoping type of abutments, that light bulb shape type that's very difficult to get into. Um, you can see your H6, H7, um, which has a very strong design. Um, your Columbia 4R4L, which is a, a general instrument, which can really, it has a nice um, ability to move into proximal very well, uh, as does your Barnhart 5.6 with a little bit of a longer reach. And your 204S um, has that shorter design, double-bladed, double so that you can put a little bit more pressure on and get a little bit more um, ability to move, maybe if you're trying to remove a piece of um, cement, excess cement. Um, so you've got a great variety of designs here in this unfilled resin tip variety. Um, these tips 
are single use. You sterilize them. They come each in a pouch. You sterilize them before use. You turn them onto the handle, um, and you use them, and then you dispose of them after a single use. Um, the reason why they are single use um, is because of the type of material that they are made out of, and the FDA has standards on how often something can be re-autoclaved. The other thing um, that you'll find, and you know, I've heard throughout the years uh, a lot of confessions by hygienists. When you take these out of the packages and you affix them to your handle, those blades are so sharp they will bite. They will bite calculus. They will bite excess cement. Um, they will bite anything in their way. Um, and that is a true benefit of the scalar system. So let's take a look at what the research has proven. Well, we know titanium curettes cause a roughening of implant surfaces in studies, and that's duplicatable. Um, Non-metal instruments and rubber cups are what we want to use to keep the implant area smooth, um, because we want to preserve that surface integrity. Non-metal instruments and air abrasives um, may be the instruments of choice for roughened surfaces. If we need to alter the surface of an implant during repair, um, we might look at some of these. And we know that if we are going to do um, surgical recare, metal instruments and burrs are really going to, to work to remove surface coating of an implant. Um, and that's really that's done by a dentist um, when a repair case has to be done. And there is a lot of research being done now on different types of, of repair cases. So to recap, we want to avoid any stainless steel instruments or any instruments that can scratch or mar. So you really want to know what your instrument is made of and make sure you're using something that's safe and effective. Um, we want to stay away from sonic and ultrasonic tips that are not specifically designed for implants. We do not want to use coarse or abrasive polishing paste. We don't want to use acidulated phosphate fluoride because that will etch titanium. We want to stay away from metal tip subgingival irrigators because they can scratch um, and they can also um, impinge on the tissue a little too much. And we want to stay away from any excessive pressure or trauma to the perimucosal seal. We don't want to do any damage to the surface of the abutment or that implant surface either. I've decided to put this uh, image here. This is a post care. It's a nylon braided cord. Okay, it's the the only of its kind available on the market, and I've decided to include it um, in this series here because it is something that has to be used with instruction for your patient, because if you use it too vigorously, it can make the tissue bleed. It can cause some irritation um, to the tissue. So if you're going to choose this as one of the products for your patient, be sure that you're giving thorough um, information and education on it. Um, I have also found, hygienists have said to me, Lynn, you know, I have um, this prosthetic type that is attached and it's so close to the tissue, you know, I just can't get any type of instrument in there. In that case, I would usually recommend some type of, of care product like this that can be threaded under a prosthetic. So if you're having a problem, a serious problem, um, with being able to get somewhere, um, this would be my next thought process for you because we know that that nylon will not scratch. If you're looking to do subgingival irrigation, um, the research proves that it is incredibly effective. Um, most of the research has been done with chlorhexidine, um, and we'll talk about chlorhexidine in a couple of slides. The cannula that you're seeing on the screen now has what are called side portal exits. And you'll notice that the irrigant flow, I'm just going to try to grab my pointer here. Um, the irrigant flow will come from the side of the tip. Um, it will not come from the very end, but it actually comes from right there from the side of the tip. And the benefit to this type of, of uh, irrigant syringe is that um, you can gently express and you don't have to worry about ripping that perimucosal seal that's at the base of the pocket, because that is a fragile seal. We know that air polishers with sodium bicarbonate um, definitely scratch and do some harm. And we also know by the work from Romaglia um, that not only um, can they scratch, but what they can do is they can cause significant tissue irritation. What we are seeing that's being researched now, especially in Europe, 
is the use of glycine powders. Now, we're seeing a lot of this research in the repair phases. When there's been bone loss, um, a doctor will flap open the tissue, try to detoxify the area to, to repair it so that maybe some uh, more bone will grow or maybe a bone graft will be done. So we're seeing the air polishers used there um, for a type of repair process. Um, still a little too early and not enough long-term research um, to convictively say um, that this is a proven and an effective method of repair, but it is being studied now. So it is something I do want to mention. And again, it is the glycine powders um, that do not scratch that are being researched in, in these research studies. So I anticipate there will be a lot more research on that in the upcoming years, so something to be, to be on the lookout for. Polishing, as you know, um, was found to be safe and effective. Um, many different varieties of tips that you can use. What you do want to avoid is any brushes, okay, because brushes can, can be a little detrimental to the tissue. Um, you can use an implant polishing paste. Toothpaste, um, everybody probably remembers tinoxide from back in the day. Um, if you're a, a newer clinician, you might not know what tinoxide is. We used it routinely years ago when we thought it was safe to polish amalgams. It restores shine and luster to metal. Since titanium um, does not have any type of irritant in it or any problematic ingredient, you can polish it with no problem. It will re not release anything that is detrimental. So polishing of, of titanium is absolutely a big plus. If you see any type of stain that has built up on the titanium or any type of um, blackening because it is a metal in the mouth, you can certainly use uh, tinoxide to, to restore that metal to its original luster. You can certainly use fine profi paste as long as there's no APF in it. Um, and definitely you want to look at a, a soft cup or if you're using a point, a soft point. Acidulated phosphate will etch. Um, not only do you have to worry about it from, you know, in the bottle or in trays, but you have to be concerned about what's in your Profi cup if you're going to use even a fine Profi cup. Just make sure that it's, it's APF free. We know that the hygienist um, should be an early part of the pre-surgical and treatment planning phases. Um, we know the importance of setting the patient up from success very early on. And quite frankly, most people lose their teeth for a reason. And a lot of times it is um, periodontal problems, um, bacterial problems that they will lose their teeth from. So making sure that these patients have been retrained in their self-care and their home care um, is very, very important. And in addition to the maintenance phase that the hygienist is going to do during that maintenance appointment, the next part that we're going to go ahead and discuss with the patient is some self-care option. You know, biofilm, I think we all uh, pretty much know the, the problems with biofilms and why we want to make sure that um, we certainly eradicate biofilms from the mouth. Um, we know a lot of different things about biofilms. Um, we know that they can be mechanically or chemically obliterated, and we know that very thick um, biofilms cannot be chemically obliterated, and there must be a mechanical removal portion. Um, we know that rough surfaces will hold more biofilm than smooth surfaces, and this is in essence why we certainly don't want to scratch. We don't want to make a roughened surface for biofilm, and then of course calculus and accretions to start to build them. We know that biofilms will move in the mouth. So if the person is dentate and has teeth and implants, it's not only important for them to keep those implants as clean as possible, but they've got to keep their teeth as clean as possible as well so that the biofilms do not travel. So if we look at um, some of the, the research that is there, we know from um, data in the research from Fox et al. That, that scaling an implant with something that will scratch can produce a rough surface. And we know that this roughened surface will then cause more formation and retention of bacterial plaque. Um, and then we'll get the biological response uh, from the plaque and inflammation. And we'll take a look at that um, in a couple of slides. So when we choose a self-care product for a patient, what do we have to think of? Well, we have to think of what are they cleaning. Um, if it's a bar like this that they're not going to be able to unscrew at home, um, we've got to give them products that can effectively get underneath that bar. Um, what are their anatomical limitations? 
You know, it's so easy for us in an office with two hands outside the mouth to be able to do oral hygiene procedures. Sometimes when you try it on yourself, it's not as easy. So we've really got to customize our approach to care for the patients to make sure that their dexterity is good enough to do um, what we're asking them to do. And we certainly want them to demonstrate back to us what we're showing them so that we can be sure that they have a good understanding of what it is that we want them to do. We also want to look at the patient's, you know, medical and, and medical health and general health. Are they taking medications that can cause some problems, um, like uh, tissue irritation or, or tissue inflammation? All of these things um, will contribute to difficulties with self-care, so we definitely want to take those into consideration and try to keep it as simple as possible for the patient. We don't really have time in the essence of time to go through every single product that is out there. Um, but I want to tell you all the products that you're looking at, you know, on your screen are safe. Um, oral irrigators, automatic or electric toothbrushes, uh, manual toothbrushes, anything given with good instruction is safe. The one thing that you want to be careful of is if a patient is going to use an interdental brush type cleaner, you want to make sure that the wire is coated with plastic. Since we know metal will scratch, we want to make sure that we're using plastic coated interdental brushes uh, or all plastic brushes. Um, the antibacterial coating on a brush is not enough. Um, it has to be plastic coated. Um, flosses, toothpicks, Whatever you're an advocate of and whatever products that you're happy with that, you know, will work in the patient's hands, um, those are the best tools to use. There are some great antimicrobials available for you. Um, chlorhexidine um, is one of them. The amount of research on chlorhexidine is vast and it is large. And one of the things that I do want to tell you about that research is that um, it does have the alcohol-based chlorhexidine in all of the research. That alcohol stabilizes out the chlorhexidine, um, so it is an ingredient that all of the research has used the, the alcohol in chlorhexidine. So there's not um, good research on the alcohol out chlorhexidine, so if you're going to choose that as an antimicrobial, definitely go ahead and stick with the one with um, the alcohol in it. As you might know, it's a broad spectrum um, antimicrobial agent. Um, it will bind to oral surfaces more than just teeth and implants. We know that the cell wall of chlorhexidine will adhere itself to titanium. Um, so it's substantive and it will stay in an area um, and provide benefits after the initial application of it, whether it be by product like a, a, a Q-tip or a toothbrush or by rinse. Um, and it definitely alters the integrity of that cell wall. Um, some of the drawbacks, people may complain um, of taste alteration or of staining. If staining is a problem, oral hygiene really needs to be addressed because you can um, avoid chlorhexidine stain by performing good oral hygiene. Um, so maybe they're going to rinse first and maybe brush afterwards. So it, it just really depends on the patient and what, what the problem at hand may be. One other antimicrobial agent is triclosan, um, and it is found in toothpaste. And what it is, it's, it's another broad spectrum antibacterial agent that does have research on it. Um, and it's got um, a history of long and safe use, um, no problem with staining a calculus um, buildup with it or taste disturbances. So it's, it, it, comes in a copolymer, um, and the copolymer will attach to the surface. And again, you've, get, you've got some substantivity of the effect of this in the mouth after you use it. So it's another antimicrobial you might want to consider for your patients. So if we're looking at the recall interval, um, I like to keep patients on a short recall interval until I get to know them really well and see what that, their abilities are. But we want to establish why did the patient lose their teeth in the first place? Was it neglect? Was it a problem with, with self-care? Those are people that really are going to need to come in very routinely. Is this a partially or a fully edentulous patient? Why does this matter? We know when you lose all the teeth in your mouth, 
you lose all of the very virulent bacteria. So there is a huge bacterial shift that happens. And fully edentulous patients tend to have a very different um, biofilm and flora in their mouth that is not as detrimental. And you may find um, a lot easier for long-term care with these patients in terms of biofilm control. But the patient's dental health or general health uh, may be a problem. Pharmacology may be a problem that they may have severe dry mouth and you may see, you know, more biofilms because of that or less biofilms, you know. So you'd have to um, assess your patient again and assess the medications and their, their dental and medical histories. How difficult is the restoration? Um, is it something that is very difficult to access? And if it is, you certainly want to have the patient coming in more regularly in shorter intervals between those appointments so that you can access uh, those areas with your instruments if need be. Um, and what's the status of, of what you're looking at? Is it in good shape? Have there been some problems? Is the patient suffering with other problems in their mouth? So you want to assess all of these things when determining your recall interval. And of course, one of the most important things is how good is their hygiene and compliance? Um, and, and you'll know that, you'll probably know that from a lot of your patients now, but you'll get to know it um, pretty quickly. So if that's your maintenance protocol, then when do we need to look to do something more? And sometimes that's when we see changes. Um, inflammation is, is one of the first changes that we'll see. The key with long-term implant success is constant assessment so that you can quickly identify if there is a change. And early intervention is the key to being successful if we've got to intervene in a problem. There's a lot of research and a lot of articles being written now on um, long-term intervention if there's a problem and how successful it truly is in the long run. And what we're seeing time and time again in the research is the earlier we catch a problem, the quicker we realize something is wrong the better we have a chance of eradicating that problem. So, you know, the hygienist is a, a very first line of defense in these cases. Do you see any bleeding? Is there any exudate? Exudate signals active infection. And it's really important that that person that has that exudate is treated rapidly to eradicate that infection because that infection will cause bone loss. So looking at your radiographs, looking at the oral hygiene in the mouth, looking at the, the restorations um, is all going to give you a clue as to if something's going on. Do you see any mobility? Are you sensing any mobility? That is another huge thing that can be problematic. If the implant body itself is mobile, that is a failed case. If it's a part or a piece, then we have a chance to prosthetically fix whatever is loose, but we'd have to assess that. And of course, if you see an increase in probing depth, um, you should be taking a radiograph to correlate the findings of the two and find out, is bone loss happening? Why is there this increase in probing depth? So what do you do when you start to see problems? Well, the first thing you've got to do is be a little bit of a super sleuth. You've got to start to figure out in your mind what's causing the problems. Because the underlying cause is going to tell you how best you should treat the case. And there's been a lot of research on looking at different problems and complications, looking at different um, antimicrobials, antibiotics, different treatment um, modalities. So let's go over a couple of those now. One of the biggest things that we are seeing now in implant dentistry is we know that excess cement can cause bone loss. You can see it poking out from the, the gingival here. You can see that big arrow that's on your screen. Excess cement can cause serious bone loss around um, implants, um, especially in a case like this, the excess cement might not be able to be detectable. Um, because of a restoration or the type of crown that's there. And, you know, that, that was the case here. And you can obviously see in that lower slide there are threads exposed there. So we've seen the bone loss here. And caught early like this, obviously you have to remove the irritant, remove that excess cement. But this case, as you can see, that tissue is flapped away because they're going to do a reparative procedure like alter that, that side of the implant, alter that surface if it's been contaminated, and try to do a bone graft and see if we can get some um, bone to regrow and fill in that area of loss. One of the things we're really working hard um, 
to teach is not overloading those crowns with cement because when you put that crown on, the excess cement has to go somewhere. And it ultimately goes into the sulcular area around that implant. Now, coincidentally here, we might want to talk about the fact that hygiene instruments are usually in the hygiene room. But excess cement is usually removed in the doctor's operatory. So it becomes very important um, for doctors to have instruments that are safe for removing excess cement in the operatories as well. So how do we know if an implant is really going to start to fail or is starting to ail? Well, there are four key signs um, that give us some indication that there's something seriously wrong with the implant. Pain would be one of them. Um, unexplained pain around an implant sometimes signals the failure of an implant, okay, because pain is not uh, demonstrative from an implant body itself. You can feel pain from tissue, but the implant body itself is inert. So you shouldn't feel pain from an implant. And if there is pain, that's usually a source of some type of, of major infection going on. Mobility is a problem, and determining what is mobile is, is incredibly important. Bone loss and exudate, which came first, the bone loss or the exudate? Well, we know exudate causes bone loss, and oftentimes after the bone loss is there, um, you will see, you know, continuing exudate continue to form and continue to, to attack an area. There are a lot of different reasons, and this is a little bit beyond the scope of what we're discussing tonight, but I want you to be able to start to theorize in your mind why we might start to see bone loss on a radiograph. Um, the slides on the left show you, obviously, you could see that the abutments have not been seeded completely in those both of those cases. And in the lower slide, you could see that an implant was actually attached to a natural tooth, which we really try not to do, because a natural tooth has that PDL, and that implant is ankylosed in bone. And that difference in bite and force and load can really cause some problems. So we know that abutment connections can be a problem how deep the implant abutment interface is in the bone. We know that the neck, the smooth neck of an implant, usually um, bone will deposit itself under that very smooth neck into the roughened surface of the implant. So we know if, if the implant is too smooth, we might see a problem. Um, the prosthetic table being countersunk under the bone may cause um, some crestal bone loss. Excessive stress and strain. Um, at the implant bone interface from occlusion, parafunction, cancer level length. Um, and then the other thing is frequent component changes. Um, just because something is screw retained doesn't mean you want to retrieve it every time they come in. We know that that frequent retrieval of pieces that are screwed in place puts too much stress on that crestal bone. One of the things I do want to look at is inflammation. Um, this is definitely an assessment parameter that we know. We know what inflammation is. We know all of those cells that are going to come into the tissue, and we know that those cells are going to work against the immune system in the body and cause inflammation. And getting to the bottom of the inflammation and, and finding out is it an oral hygiene problem, is there an irritant in the pocket like that excess cement or like calculus that needs to be removed is very important. When you have inflammation around an implant, that is called peri-implant mucositis. It's everything you know about gingivitis around a tooth, except it happens around an implant. Um, and you see some clear cases of that on, on the pictures and on the slides um, in front of you. We know from some of the research, and this is um, from the Journal of the Canadian Dental Association in 2011, that we can stage peri-implant mucositis. And we know that if it progresses too far, it's going to turn into peri-implantitis, which we're going to look at next. So again, the key is early assessment of these phases so that you can intervene, do oral hygiene instruction with the patient, maybe do some debridement. Um, in severe cases where bone loss is starting to happen, you're going to have to do some type of repair situation. Peri-implantitis is everything you know about periodontitis, except it happens around an implant. Bacterial load is, is very much the same. And we know very much the way bone is lost around a tooth, bone can be lost around an implant as well. And then you're chasing yourself, because then biofilm gets in that area, and calculus may um, start to develop. And then it causes some significant um, maintenance issues. 
Common periodontal chemotherapeutic agents are not FDA approved for usage around implants. Now, there has been some research done, um, especially with Arrestin, um, that has proved during certain phases um, we might see some really great results to eradicate maybe exudate or localized infection. But again, that's an off-label use. I've got to be clear that FDA approved these drugs for periodontal chemotherapeutic agents, not for use around implants. Let's take a look a little bit um, at the, the final things that we're going to look at is two different decision trees tonight. Um, this is a cumulative treatment modality um, adapted from Dr. Nicholas Lang, um, CIST, Cumulative Interceptive Supportive Therapy, um, and it builds on itself. You start with A, you move to B, C, and D, and you're always starting at A. So if you've got to do surgery, you still do the mechanical debridement, antiseptic therapy, antibiotic therapy before you get to surgery. And basically what we're looking at is how deep the pocket it is, which is your white box. We're looking at um, how um, much plaque is developed or as if there is bleeding, and that's going to start to tell us if we need to intervene with treatment. Um, so if we see plaque and bleeding, we're going to want to do a mechanical debridement um, and some polishing. If pockets start to grow and we see more, maybe some bone loss, maybe bleeding on probing, um, maybe we're going to add an antiseptic into that. Um, regime there. And then as we go further, if that's not enough, maybe we're going to add some type of s systemic or local antibiotic therapy. And in cases where there's significant bone loss and bleeding, um, that might be a case where then we're going to have to get into regeneration. The doctor is going to have to replan the case, do some type of surgical procedure, maybe work with um, some different types of clinicians um, to get that done. So this is one decision tree for looking at the pocket depth, is there bleeding, is there plaque, and determining what our treatment is going to be for those patients. The ICUI did a um, study looking at implant success rates, and we looked at um, success and survival and failure, and we came up with um, our own um, continuum of care for implants. And we looked at success rates being early, moderate, and long-term, uh, making sure that we looked at these um, implants that were also restored. That was important to look at for us. And we came up with um, a health scale for implants. And the first um, section one of the health scale is when we have what's called success. There's no pain or tenderness, no mobility, less than two millimeters of radiographic bone loss from the surgery, less than a five millimeter probing depth with absolutely no history of exudate. We're going to go ahead and do normal maintenance on that patient. When we get to phase two for survival and the patient is of satisfactory health, we'll still see no pain or mobility, but now we're starting to see some bone loss maybe two to four millimeters radiographically. A probing depth may go up to five to seven millimeters, but still no exudate history. We're going to reduce stress, reduce the interval between hygiene appointments, um, make sure that we take yearly radiographs, might have to do a gingivoplasty to reduce the area where um, biofilm, calculus, et cetera, can develop. In stage three of survival, when there's been compromised health of the patient, um, we're going to see no mobility, a radiographic bone loss of four millimeters, but still less than half of the implant body. You'll see a deeper probing depth of greater than seven millimeters. Now there may be a history of exudate in this patient, but still no pain upon function. We're going to work to reduce stress, introduce some type of drug therapy like an antibiotic or maybe um, uh, that, a locally de uh, delivered anti antimicrobial like chlorhexidine. Um, there'll be surgical reentry at this point, uh, change in prosthetic or implants if, you know, we're going to try to be successful at saving that implant. And unfortunately, when we've done all that we can, sometimes we will see a clinical or an absolute failure of the implant. Um, and that when, is when there is any type of mobility of the implant body, there's pain upon function. More than half of the length of the implant is radiographic in bone loss when there's uncontrolled exudate or it's actually no longer in the mouth. Um, so if it's no longer in the mouth, you don't have to worry about removing it, um, but any of the other would cause the implant to need to be removed. Um, so there's the, health, the ICOI's health scale for dental implants. Another flow chart, again, um, to give you some indication of 
assessing the patient, taking your assessment parameter that you're finding, and then applying some type of treatment that will be um, well worked in for that patient. The next best thing to knowing something is knowing where to find it. So I hope I've given you the answer this evening to, to burning questions that you've had related to implant maintenance protocols.